Hello, it's good to be here today, and I'm talking about energy, and it's actually really fitting that this is the talk between the environment and the energy track, because really, the way that we've produced our energy today has always had a trade-off between those two different things. I'm going to talk about fusion energy. Anyone here know anything about fusion? Back to the Future, Iron Man, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm a PhD plasma physicist, which is what you do if you want to do fusion from MIT. And I'm the CEO of a, a company that does fusion. It's one of the, the main ones out there. There's now about 17 companies that do fusion. But I'm actually not going to talk about my company very much today. Instead, I'm going to talk about where we are as a field, um, what to look for, where we come from, and where are we going. So uh, this can actually go back to about 1940, 1945, which a lot of the energy and environmental technologies all can be traced back there. That was, of course, after World War II, when our modern industrialized society started to occur. We started to use oil in very, very large amounts. We invented nuclear power. And at that same time, we also started to ask questions and understand how the stars worked. Um, and it all came sort of on an onrush all at once. And one of the things that happened after that is we chose to build our modern society on energy from fossil fuels. In hindsight, maybe that wasn't a good thing. Um, and it's led to what we see today as needing an entirely new energy infrastructure. And whether that it develops from uh, innovation or from continuation, we're still fighting that out right now. But certainly, um, what we do know is that we're not going to stop using energy. That on the left here shows the energy use per person and the human development index and it is monotonically increasing. That the last basically 400 years of human existence have been defined by finding energy, using energy, and making people's lives better. And on the right is the other side of that equation, on the environment, where so far our choices to do that have been to emit lots of CO2. And this has been linked pretty much since uh, we found coal in Wales, and then oil in Texas in the Middle East. But there's another energy source out there that we've known about since this, the 1940s, and that's fusion energy. Fusion energy is basically the opposite of nuclear power. So when you have a big, heavy uranium nucleus, it wants to fall apart, and if you can get it to fall apart, it converts a tiny little bit of its mass into energy. That's E equals mc squared. C squared is a very big number. Einstein's right. That comes out as a whole lot of power. Um, but it also comes out as pieces of, of daughter atoms, of nuclear waste. It's the transuranics. It's the cesiums and americiums and the things that we don't want to release into the environment. At the complete other end of the mass scale is the hydrogens. And when you take hydrogen, isotopes of hydrogen, and you combine them together, you get not big, heavy, radioactive things. You get helium. And in that process, you release enormous amounts of energy. You release 200 million times more energy per reaction there than you do of, say, taking a hydrocarbon and breaking its bonds. And that is how the stars work. So in fact, that's actually how all of the matter that's in us and in this building was created, was from building up from, from small building blocks of, of the hydrogens all the way up to the carbon, all the way up to lead. And inside these big, huge engines that are the stars. But we obviously can't do fusion on Earth the same way a star does. You could see some obvious problems there. Star does it through gravity. It needs to have enough mass to make a star. It's not something we're going to put in a building. Um, but we have to recreate the conditions inside there. And if we were able to do that, we would be able to make an energy source that would be pretty unique in the world. Because here it would have no emissions. Its fuel would be just isotopes of hydrogen that are everywhere. They're in seawater, some lithium, which is in the crust that we'd have enough of that fuel to power our entire society today longer than we expect the sun to live. So you know, it becomes a problem of, of intergalactic, intersolar problem, not a problem of the next decade. And um, 
out of that, there's no meltdown, there's no chain reaction, there's no of the long-lived nuclear waste. Um, and this is something that we would say is a, a globally scalable energy source. So it's something that fits into modern grids, a machine that you put somewhere that makes a lot of power. Sounds great, right? Like, um, to put it in sort of really big perspective, here's how we get most of our energy today. Here's an oil tanker. That oil tanker has got about a half a billion uh, euros worth of oil in it. If you were to filter the water that's displaced by that oil tanker, and only a fraction of that, you would get a little bit of deuterium, be like this big, and it would, if you were to fuse it, it would make as much energy as burning all that oil. Um, so you've taken a problem and you've changed it by about somewhere around seven orders of magnitude. And um, that's a profound change in our current way of getting energy, of finding places to extract it either from the ground, the air, the, 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 the solar radiation, um, and then concentrate it. This shows up as concentrated. And how, how do we envision fusion energy working? So obviously we, I've alluded to how the stars operate. We basically put the star inside a machine, produce heat, and make power conversion. Anyone see a, a major problem with this? Like stars? Stars are pretty hot. You would need to be actually hotter than a star to do that. You would need to be about 100 million degrees Fahrenheit. Kelvin, Celsius, it doesn't really matter. You have to be really, really hot. And that means you have to build a machine that sits in a room that's like room temperature that has something that's 100 million degrees in it. That sounds pretty difficult, but that's actually done around the world today. It's done in laboratories that are funded by the governments. It's done in startups. It's done in industrial companies. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, there was a 12-year-old kid in California who made 100 million degree plasma in a machine um, that made some fusion reactions. And so we we've, we've understand this state of matter well enough to be able to manipulate it, but that's not everything that's needed. Um, there's other things that have to happen. That machine has to be able to have that hot plasma, but also has to be able to insulate um, the plasma from the walls well enough that it can produce more power than it takes to heat it. You can imagine if I wanted to make my house very hot, um, I could leave all the doors open, and I could have a huge furnace, and I'd get it hot, but it wouldn't be very economical. And in fusion, same rules apply. You have to find a way to insulate it. So this is, can be shown in a science space on a plot like this. So we think of fusion as uh, how much power out over how much it takes to run. We call that number Q. And so for the last 60 years that we've been studying this technology, it's been a race to higher and higher levels, closer and closer to more power out than in. That's sort of the threshold where now things become, you could see a, a commercial pathway. It's no longer just an experiment. It has a, a pathway to becoming useful. And on the right of this plot is the other, or the combination of all the things you need in order to get more power out than in. More power out than in lives in the upper right. Notice it's a logarithmic plot on both axes, so that means this covers a huge amount of physical space. I said we had to get the plasma very hot. That's on the x-axis. The unit of 10 there is 100 million degrees. So the 100 million degrees is so hot that plasma physicists had to invent a smaller unit. Um, and then on the, the y-axis is the other two things you need. Confinement, so how well you insulate it, and density, how much stuff you have. And um, all those data points are machines that have been built around the world by national labs, by um, small companies across the last decades. And what you can see is that we've actually gotten pretty close to Q greater than 1. In fact, the blue points that are in the upper right there are at Q of 0.7. There's a machine um, across the, the channel in the UK that's gotten to 0.7. There's a machine in Japan that's, that lives up there. Um, and then there's lots of other things that we've tried. Um, and, and that's all contributed to this very large body of knowledge of fusion energy, plasma physics, um, understanding what we need to make a power source. So in some ways, you'd say, OK, we're, we're pretty close um, on the science, but we've, we've stopped a little short. 
So who's all, who's all working on this, and what's the trajectory to get past that? Where, where is the world putting its effort, um, and why do we think that now is an interesting time in fusion? So there's basically two different approaches that people are using to do this. And they're not just technical approaches. They're organizational approaches. They're finance approaches. They even have commercial implications. So on the left is the, a machine called Eater. And it's a machine that's being built in the south of France. It's actually um, Catarash at CEA, uh, next to CEA. That machine is an international collaboration basically among the world's industrialized company, uh, countries. So it's the US, the EU, Japan, China, India, South Korea, Russia. You can imagine what it takes to pull all those people together to go and build a single giant project. And it turns out that that's the largest science experiment that will have ever been attempted in the world. It's the most expensive thing that's been built on, single thing built on Earth. It's about $50 billion. It's halfway through construction, and it's the largest science, or it's the largest construction project in continental Europe. And that machine in the lower left there, if you look really closely, there's a guy wearing a tie with a hard hat on, a couple pixels tall. So that's a very big machine. But it's being built. It's going to turn on in 2025, and thereafter, it's going to make an attempt to get to Q of 10. So past that line, where we'd be making 500 megawatts of thermal power um, in a single device uh, with a gain of 10. And the world's really convinced this is going to work. This is a statement of conviction by the, that the science is ready to make such a large investment in it. And if, you, if we go back and we look at the previous plot, that's the approach that's in the blue dots. So take those blue dots and make them over the line by making it basically larger. On the, the other side of this plot are other approaches where people have said, OK, um, if we do the continuation of those blue dots, it means that looks like we have to make it really big. That maybe doesn't look commercial. What if we took all the other things we've learned in the interim, things around uh, simulation, the, the tools have gotten bet better and better. Fusion is actually one of the, the main drivers of super, supercomputer simulation. Machine learning, additive manufacturing, control systems. What if we took those and we found some white space in plasma physics and built, built machines to explore that white space? And there's now a bunch of about $1.3 billion of private capital backing companies that are doing just that. Some of these companies are like TriAlpha, which is in California, General Fusions in Canada. Um, there's a couple in the UK. There's Lockheed Martin, large defense contractor who's building fusion systems. They're starting from further behind in the plasma physics. It's less demonstrated. Um, but because they're at much smaller scale, they're hoping to be able to iterate very quickly. And they're proving that you can iterate quickly in fusion. And I think this is one of the major trends that we see in energy technologies in general which is that people are aggregating capital, sometimes in groups of uh, 10 to $100 million, building teams together, and building machines that in the past only governments could ever think about building. Um, and certainly, these companies have done that. So how close are we? What should we be looking for? And you know, when will we see it? So one way to think about this is Fusion's got this long-term joke that uh, it's 30 years away and always will be. And that really ignores the amount of progress that's been made. Um, it's like saying there's a mountain out there, and it's never been summited, summited and so no one's ever going to do it. And what we've actually seen is people have started to climb that mountain, and they've built base camps all the way up. So the, the EU, the US have put about $100 billion into research of building up those fusion base camps. And it's now just below that first summit. And they're making an attempt. One of the attempts is to very methodically climb that last, peaks, that last peak. And the other attempts are to basically look for a clearing in the weather, find new pieces of technology, and rush at it as fast as possible. And over the next about 10 years, maybe even less, maybe like five years, we'll see whether anyone gets to that point where we make more power out than in, and we have a technology that looks like it could be useful, and then 
the next steps will be how to make that work continuously and cost effectively and put it into the existing grid, sort of looking at the top, standing at the top of a mountain and looking out and seeing what's next. So for our company, the way that we attack this is we use the same physics that's in ITER and a lot of the same people that contributed to that, the same science. Um, but we've looked and said, okay, there's, there's other things that have happened since we decided to take that approach. One of those things is a new superconductor, completely unrelated to fusion, just like machine learning is unrelated to fusion, um, just like additive manufacturing is unrelated to fusion, but something that happened in a different field, and that's a superconductor that allows it to go to much higher magnetic field, so bigger, badder magnets. And we use that superconductor to take the machine, eater on the right, and try to do the same sort of physics in a scale that's much, much smaller by cranking up the magnetic field. And so that's what Commonwealth Fusion Systems is doing. And like the other startups, we're backed by people that really believe in the mission that we need to switch the energy system, that we, don't, we shouldn't have a trade-off between the environment and energy, and technology can be the solution for that including basically the last energy technology we would ever need, which is the energy technology that the world has already chosen, the universe, sort of has ordained as the ultimate energy technology. And in our pathway, we've finished running a machine that's on the left there that was funded by the US Department of Energy. We ran that machine, and we currently hold the record for uh, tokamak plasma pressure, basically two of the things you need for fusion. And we're, we're designing the machine in the middle, and we hope to have that run running in the mid-2020s. And thereafter, a, a commercial system would be on the right, and that would be a very power-dense, city-powering fusion system at like 200 megawatts electric, where you're now out replacing the gas plants. And so in closing, I like this slide a lot because it sort of sums up the promise of fusion and the current situation. This is usually a title slide, but if you look at it, you see we have the planet, and we're looking at the dark side of it. But here's all those lights. Those lights came from the time we chose fossil fuel as our energy source. And they've enabled all of that. That's human happiness. But there's still dark spots. Those people, they want those lights too. And they deserve to have them. But then there's this thin layer of the atmosphere that is really saying, like, can we afford to do all that? Meanwhile, out, out there on the very right, is billions and billions uncountable stars that are using an energy source that we have yet to do, and an energy source that gives us all of our heat and light, something that we want to bring to Earth, bring closer, and that's a monumental task, but it's a task that's worth doing. It's a task that the world's working on right now, and it's a task that in the next 10 years, we should see some major changes in as we sort of reach the penultimate steps. So I think that gives a good view of fusion. And if you, you want to talk about it more, I'll be uh, over on the right with some colleagues. So please come and ask questions. Thank you.